I've already done a couple of tree identification videos and they were for the trees that are larger or more well known or otherwise more valuable to loggers. But today I wanted to spend some time talking about understory species. Species that never get that large and maybe people don't know quite as well. Pin cherry has smoothish bark that can get a little bit flaky towards the bottom on some trees. They'll have these horizontal kind of blistery things on them. And they like to grow uh, in along old logging roads or I'm staying on a railroad bed right now so they tend to grow back uh, wherever it had been disturbed before. Pin cherry is related to its larger cousin the black cherry um, and the bark when has some of the flakiness of a black cherry. You'll see a lot of horizontal lines in the bark and on the upper limbs the bark tends to be smooth as opposed to black cherry which is a whole lot flakier. Pin cherry leaves look just like black cherry leaves. They're football shaped. have really fine teeth along the edges of them and when you break a green twig, a pin cherry like a black cherry just has a pretty bad smell to it. Once I tried burning pin cherry as firewood and it just isn't any good. It has a pithy wood with no heat in it. As you travel up the trunk, pin cherry bark smooths right out. And pin cherry will put on little white flowers in the spring and have little red berries towards the end of the summer, neither of which are on the trees at the moment. Just for comparison, this would be considered a pretty big pin cherry. Ironwood is very aptly named because it has hard, hard, dense wood. It makes really good firewood. The only problem is because the tree isn't that big, it takes a long time to get a cord of it. I say they're a small tree. I have seen ironwood that are 15, 16 inches at chest high, but they'll always be short and stubby. Another name for the ironwood is the hop hornbeam. And it gets its name because a little fruiting body called a catkin looks a lot like hops that brewers make beer from. Ironwood leaves are football shaped and serrated on the edge. And uh, this is a bigger one. They tend to run a bit smaller than this most of the time. There's parallel lines running up and down the tree. A bit of flakiness to it. Some ironwood gets so flaky that you can actually peel flakes of bark off of it, making it look sort of like hickory. Musclewood trees are also known as the American hornbeam. I've heard old timers call it water beach. Uh, the figure of the musclewood bark, especially in the bigger trees, tends to look like a flexed muscle. Musclewood never really gets all that big. That's the leaf of a musclewood. Vaguely football shaped and finely toothed at the perimeter. When the leaves are off, you can tell any member of the hornbeam family because it has very fine twigs. You know, as, the, as you get to the tip of the twigs, they're just really wispy. This is late June and it's the time of year when the seed pods form. Those are known as catkins. The box elder is not really an understory species. In fact, it can get quite big. But they'll never be the dominant tree in any woods. Box elder just tend to have this form where they're leaning or crooked or jagged. They're never tall and straight. Box elder trees are also known as split leaf maple or even ash leaf maple. And the leaves can resemble that of an ash, but they usually come in clusters of three as opposed to five or seven like an ash. Really serrated like that coarsely. Like any member of the maple family, which, which this is, the twigs will be paired. It will be a mirror image of each other coming off a main branch. 
called opposite twigs. The bark of a box elder can be pretty easy to confuse with ash. You'll never confuse the wood though. Box elder have a closed green wood as opposed to ash which has an open green wood, meaning it's much more porous. It doesn't split or burn like ash either. Giveaway of a service berry tree is it has smooth bark but with these long lines that run up and down the trunk. This is also known as a shad bush. They do grow a red berry that ripens in July and they're sweet and tasty but they're tough to get to. They're high over your head and the birds eat them just as soon as they ripen. Service berry leaves are oval with fine serrations on the edges. You have a nice pretty white flower in May. You're likely to find sumac on field edges and under power lines and along people's backyards. Anywhere where they're going to get direct sunlight. Sumac have a compound leaf that looks a lot like a walnut tree leaf. But sumac will never gain the size of a walnut. Their trunks tend to be spindly. In the fall, sumac leaves turn a bright red that you just can't miss. This is the seed head of a sumac in the early summer. And by the end of the summer, early fall, it'll be much larger and it'll be bright red. You can't mistake them. They're very striking when you have a grove of sumac. I've heard you can make a tea from them. I find sumac flowers have no flavor whatsoever. I can't imagine what the tea would taste like other than be tinged red. Sumac wood is very pithy and has no strength to it. You can break off branches very easily and you can break the trees down without much effort either. This is getting to be what I'd consider a larger sumac trunk. And when they get any size to them, you find they tend to get banged up looking like that. Usually by the time they're big, they're towards the end of their life and you'll see flaws in the bark at the bottom. Striped maple is hard to miss because it has all these great big leaves that are three-pronged and their shape sort of like a duck's foot. Striped maple gets its name from the green and white stripe patterns on its bark. Striped maple will stump sprout. You can see how this was cut maybe five years ago and from that same stump all these others grew. Here's a striped maple that managed to get a bit bigger. When I lived in Maine, the locals would call it moose maple because in the winter, moose would come and strip long pieces of bark off the striped maple to eat it when there's nothing else around. It looks sort of like service berry, but it's much more greenish. Here's one of my favorites is the American dogwood. In May, it grows these big white flowers that are just so cool looking. Their leaves tend to curl inward like that, and when you splay them out, they're sort of football sheet. They can be all different sizes like that. They tend to be fairly deeply veined and kind of waxy. There is what the flower turns into after it's been fertilized and the petals have dropped away. And that will grow into the little berries that form the seeds. They tend to grow not fully in the sun and not fully in the shade. And this one here is fairly good sized as far as dogwood go. And they often get problems in the trunk like that when they get older. This is the witch hazel. It's an understory tree. It doesn't get more than like 15 feet tall or so. Uh, it has these leaves that just, you know them when you see them. Which hazel bark is fairly smooth with little warts on it and they do tend to grow in, in clumps. Very common to see many stems coming out of one root. By the end of the summer a witch hazel will put out all these little nuts. They got at the tip of them there's these four little lobes. These aren't great examples because it's the wrong time of year for it but I dug these up. I'm going to slip this in just because it's an interesting little plant. It's called a barren strawberry. It looks a lot like a regular wild strawberry. It has a leaflets of three. 
and the berries red and uh, you, you taste them and they taste like nothing nothing at all so a barren strawberry is is a very good name for them <laughs>